Now we are going to talk about the use of micropiles and uh, nanotechnologies in ground improvement. So first look at the soil improvement techniques and here we are going to consider the option of micropiles. Introduction Micropiles were conceived in Italy in the early 1950s in response to the demand for innovative techniques for underpinning historic buildings and monuments that had sustained damage during World War II. A reliable method was required to support structural loads with minimal movement and for installation in assess restrictive environments and with minimal disturbance to the existing structure. An Italian specialty contractor called Fonde Dial and Dr. Fernando Lizzi developed the technique. The use of micropiles has grown significantly and have been used mainly as elements for foundation support to resist static and seismic loading conditions and as in situ reinforcements for slope and excavation stability. Piles are divided into general types as uh, displacement piles and uh, replacement piles. Displacement piles are members that are driven or vibrated into the ground, thereby displacing the surrounding soil laterally during installation. Replacement piles are placed or constructed with in a previously drilled borehole, thus replacing the excavated ground. Now I need your attention, a micropile is a small diameter, less than 300 millimeter, drilled and grouted pile that is typically reinforced. Now look at the classification of micropiles based on design application. Case 1 micropile elements which are loaded directly and where the pile reinforcement resists the majority of the applied load. Case 2, micropile elements circumscribe and uh, internally reinforce the soil to make a reinforced soil composite that resists the applied load. Now this figure you can see that the drilled micropiles under a building, these are the micropiles. Now, review of applications. Look at in situ replacement. We are having the application in slope stabilization and earth retention, ground strengthening and protection, settlement reduction, structural stability. And if you just look at the structural support, then you would find the application earth retention, foundation for new structures, underpinning of existing foundations, the seismic uh, retrofitting, and then the scour protection, repair, uh, repair or replacement of ex existing foundations, uh, arresting or prevention of movement, and upgrading of foundation capacity. Uh, so these are the different applications and uh, here you can see the applications again under the heading of uh, structure for structural support that is the case one and the case two in situ replacement. So you can see here new foundations underpinning of existing structures, 
seismic retrofitting of existing structures, scour protection, earth retention. And under in situ reinforcement, that is the case too, you may consider the slope stabilization, earth retention, ground strengthening and protection, settlement reduction. Now, this is the figure showing the classical arrangement of root piles for underpinning. So you can see that this, the micro piles, and if you just look at, this is basically the vertical cross section and the horizontal cross section. So you can see these are the micro piles in this case. Now here the typical network of uh, reticulated micro piles. Uh, reticulated uh, means constructed, arranged or marked like a net or a network. So in a network, you know, you are having the set of micro piles. So you can see here the micro piles. Look at that. And uh, this is the diagram showing the typical column plan view. So you can see a number of uh, micro piles. Well, if you just recall the case one, that means the micro piles are directly loaded. So you can see here different cases of micro piles which are directly loaded. And uh, this figure is meant for the case two. Uh, micro piles, reticulated pile network with an enforced soil mass loaded or engaged. So here you can see the micro piles here, here, here. And here again the case number one is mentioned. So you can see the use of micro piles over here. And this is again the case two and you can see there the retaining structure and the micro pile have been used over here. Okay, now look at the classification based on construction type. The method of grouting is generally the most sensitive construction control over grout or ground bond capacity. Grout to grout capacity varies with the grouting method. And uh, look at type A, gravity grout. B, type B, that is the pressure through casing. Then the type C, single global post grout and the type D multiple repeatable post route. So here you can see the type A. Here the grout is placed under gravity head only using sand cement motor, motor or neat cement. Type B in this type neat cement grout is placed in to the hole as the temporary steel casing is withdrawn Injection pressure varies from 0.5 to 1 megapascal. The pressure is limited to avoid fracturing of the surrounding ground. So here you can see that this is the type A case. This is the type B where the pressure is uh, being used to inject the grout. And similarly, this is the type C and this is the type D. And you would find the description of these uh, C and D types on the next slide. So type C, this is done in two step process. Number one, as of type A. And then number two, prior to hardening of primary grout, similar grout is injected one time via a sleeve grout pipe at pressure of at least one megapascal. Then comes the type D. This is done in two step process. 
of grouting similar to type C with modification to step 2 where the pressure is injected at a pressure of 2 to 8 megapascal. So in this case you know the pressure is high from 2 to 8 megapascal. Advantages of micropiles. Micropiles are often used to underpin the existing structure where need of minimal vibration or noise is of prime importance. Micropiles can be easily laid where low headroom is a constraint. Micropiles can be easily installed at any angle below the horizontal using the same equipment used for ground anchors and grouting projects. Uh, offer a practical and cost effective solution to costly alternative pile systems as well as a solution to job site with difficult assess. Do not require large assess road or drilling platforms. So here you can see that the micro pile construction sequence using casing. So you can see this is the step, first step, then this is the second step, and then the, the third one, the casing has been introduced, and then the grouting is being done. So that is the sequence of construction that we use in the construction of micro pile. Outline of design steps. Number one, review available project information. Review geotechnical data. Number three, geotechnical design. Number four, pile structural design. Number five, combined geotechnical and structural design considerations. Number six, additional micro pile system considerations. First look at the determination of geotechnical bond capacity. Allowable geotechnical bond axial load capacity that is P sub G allowable can be determined by the following equation. This is the equation. And here alpha sub bond nominal length is equal to the grout to ground bond capacity of pile from table 1A. I will show that I will show that table. Then here in the formula, you can see that P sub G allowable, that is the allowable geotechnical bond axial load. So this is the table 1A and you can see that summary of typical alpha sub bond nominal strength in KPA values, grout to ground bond for micro pile design. So this is the type A, type B, type C and type D and we have already discussed these types. And uh, here you can see the soil or rock description. So accordingly, you can pick some suitable value of alpha sub bond nominal strength in KPA from this table. Determination of geotechnical end bearing capacity. The design is done similar to end bearing drilled shafts or driven piles or maybe based on a previous load test experience of similar projects. Q sub A is equal to Q sub U over factor of safety, where Q sub A is the allowable bearing capacity, Q sub U is the ultimate bearing capacity, and the safety factor is generally taken as 2.5. Micro pile structural design. Well, uh, pile case length structural capacity for strain compatibility between casing and bar, the yield stress of steel is taken as follows. So yield stress of steel that is minimum of F sub Y bar and F sub Y casing. Where F sub Y steel that is the yield stress of steel, F sub Y bar that is the yield stress of bar and F sub Y that is the F sub Y casing that is the yield stress of casing. So here you can see that this is the micro pile and uh, you can see that the different terms that we are using here uh, this figure is showing the details of a composite reinforced micro pile.
Now here on an exaggerated scale you can see the micro pile and you can see the load on the pile that is P pile, P sub pile that is kilonewton and you can see that this is the pile bond length and you can see that the casing is up to this level so this is the casing plunge length if the casing plunge length uh, is uh, from this point to this so in that case the pile bond length becomes equal to the casing plunge length and here you can see grout to ground bond that is alpha sub bond nominal strength over here d that is the diameter <coughs> and uh, transfer load that is p sub transferring kilonewton that is equal to this formula so in this figure you can see the detail of load transfer through the casing plunge length Pile cased length structural capacity. Nominal allowable tensile strength can be determined by the following equation. Look at this. So this is a P sub T allowable. This is the allowable structural tensile strength. Uh, compressive allowable load that is P sub C allowable that is equal to this. And here you can see that P sub T allowable, that is the allowable structural tensile strength. P sub C, that, P sub C allowable, that is the allowable compressive strength. A sub grout, that is the area of grout. A sub bar is the area of reinforcement. And A sub casing is the casing area. So pile uncased length structural capacity the tensile and compressive allowable loads for the uncased bond length is given below that means uh, cased bond length or plunge length allowable load is equal to p sub transfer allowable and uh, p sub transfer allowable that is equal to this formula and uh, you know alpha sub bond nominal strength that is equal to the geotechnical unit grout to ground bond strength uh, if we consider the tension allowable load that is p sub t allowable that is equal to this formula and the compressive allowable load that is p sub c allowable that is equal to this so look at these formulas meant for tension allowable load and the compression allowable load prediction of anticipated structural axial displacement when pile designs require displacement criteria such as earthquake analysis it may be necessary to predict pile stiffness and deflection limits during designs and confirm through load test for an anchor or micro pile, the elastic displacement can be approximated by the following equation. This one. Where delta sub elastic, that is the elastic component of total displacement, P is the applied load, L is the elastic length, and A sub is and A times E, that is the stiffness of the section. Now here we are going to consider one design example. Look at the statement. Design micro piles for an embankment with top width of 4 meter width and 2 meter high and 1 to 2 slope on both sides with unit weight of embankment of fill of 17 kiloton per cubic meter on a soft soil to improve the bearing capacity in a uniform deposit of medium clay with unconfined compressive strength of 100 kiloton per square meter. Consider the diameter of the micro pile as 0.1 meter with a minimum spacing of three times center to center. 
There is a surcharge load of 20 kp on the fill. Pile bond length is 10 meter and the casing plunge length is also equal to the pile bond length in this particular example. Now look at the solution. Unconfined compressive strength of soil Q sub U is 100 kPa so obviously C sub U would be the half of that and that is 50 kPa. Point load capacity of single pile is given by this formula Q sub P U that is C U multiplied by N sub C into A sub P and you are getting the answer 3.53. Skin friction resistance of single pile that is uh, a Q sub F and that is uh, equal to alpha times C sub U into A sub S and uh, by plugging the values you are getting the value of Q sub F equal to 141.3 kN. So obviously ultimate capacity of single pile that is coming equal to 145 that is 3.53 plus 141.3 so it's almost 145 kN total load from the embankment including 20 kp of surcharge that is 4 plus 4 plus 4 that is 12 into 17 plus 20 into 4 that means 284 kN per meter length of the embankment so considering 1 meter length so you can say that it is 284 kiloton. Ultimate load capacity of pile group of three piles spaced at 0.3 meter center to center. That is obviously 145 multiplied by 3 and that is equal to 435 kilonewton. So factor of safety that is 435 over 284 that is 1.53 hence configuration of micro pile group with the above ultimate capacity is appropriate. Okay, now determination of allowable structural and geotechnical pile loads. Pile case length allowable load. Material dimensions and properties. Casing use 120 millimeter outside diameter and 10 millimeter wall thickness. Pile casing inside diameter is obviously equal to 120 minus 2 into 10 that is 100 millimeter pile casing steel area is 3454 square millimeter yield strength of casing f sub y casing that is 240 megapascal use reinforcing bar of yield strength of 415 megapascal of 25 millimeter diameter grout compressive strength 30 megapascal for strain compatibility between casing and rebar use for steel yield stress so f y sub f sub y steel that is the minimum of f sub y bar and f sub y casing and that is obviously 240 megapascal Nominal allowable tensile strength can be determined by the following equation, this equation. So just plug in the values, you are getting the answer 520.608 kN. Compressive allowable load can be determined by using this formula. So just plug in the values and you are getting the answer 539.083 kN. Allowable geotechnical bond load from table 1a that I, I have already shown select an ultimate unit grout to ground bond strength and that is alpha sub bond nominal strength that is 190 kPa allowable geotechnical bond axial load capacity that is P sub G allowable can be determined by the following equation so look at that so just plug in the values and you are getting the answer 238.64 kN. So here the bond length is equal to 10 meter and uh, uh, fire bond that is the bond diameter that is 0.1, milli, 0.1 meter. Now here look at the mechanism. 
so here you can see that uh, if the micro pile is there and uh, shear force is of uh, huge magnitude so you can see that you are having the failure of the micro pile in this way but here this is the stable case where the my, uh, micro pile is intact Uh, there are some softwares and through the softwares uh, the results of the analysis without excavation support can be visualized in this manner and you can see there's uh, this these colors are mentioning that uh, this case is not stable whereas in this particular case you can see that uh, factor of safety is fairly high. Now here you can see the use of micro piles at uh, the retention systems. Look at that micro piles, which are being used in this retention system. This is a closer view. Another view of the micro piles. So concluding remarks about the micro piles. Use of micro piles is versatile in situ ground improvement technique and has been used very effectively in many stability problems. In many cases, micro piles are loaded or tested following typical codes of practice, FHWA, pile load test of British standards, etc., to measure the vertical and lateral capacities of the piles which are required in the validation of the design configuration and redesign if required. Now we are going to discuss this topic. The title of the topic is Nanotechnologies in Soil Improvement and Site Remediation. Nanotechnology is an emerging field. It is an interdisciplinary science whose potential has been widely touted for well over a decade. Well, here the word tout has been used. Basically, the tout means advertising for customers in an aggressive manner. Nanotechnology, which deals with understanding and control of matter at dimension of roughly 100 nanometer and below has cross-sectoral applications and orientations. At the commercial level, the impact of nanotechnology is evident in three major industry sectors, namely materials and uh, manufacturing, coatings and composites for products like automobiles and buildings, electronics, displays and batteries, and healthcare and life sciences pharmaceutical applications. A nanometer is 1,000 millionth of a meter. A single human hair is about 80,000 nanometer wide. A red blood cell is approximately 7,000 nanometer wide. A DNA molecule 2 to 2.5 nanometer and a water molecule almost 0.3 nanometer. Applications in civil engineering. First look at the application in concrete. Addition of nanoscale material into cement could improve its performance. Uh, many researchers have worked on the nanomaterials. So Lee 2004 found that nano SiO2 <clears throat> could significantly increase the compressive strength of concrete. <clears throat> containing large volume 
fly ash <coughs> at early age and improve pore size distribution by filling the pores between large fly ash and cement particles at nanoscale. It has also been reported that adding small amount of carbon nanotube one person by weight could increase both compressive and flexile strength. When the micro capsules are broken by a crack, the healing agent is released into the crack and contact with the catalyst. The polymerization happens and bond the crack faces. The self-healing polymer could be especially applicable to fix the micro cracking in bridge piers and columns, but it requires costly epoxy injection. Structural Composites Sandvik Nanoflex TM Nanoflex TM is new stainless steel with uh, ultra high strength, good formability and a good surface finish developed by Sandi Sandvik Nanoflex Materials Technology is suitable for application which requires lightweight and rigid designs. It's good corrosion and wear resistance can keep life cycle cost low. Attractive or wear resistant surfaces can be achieved by various treatments. And here you would find the applications in geotechnical engineering. Although never considering themselves nanotechnologists, Soil scientists and engineers with their interest in the study of clay size particles less than 0 0.002 millimeter are among the earliest workers in the field of nanotechnology. Most material types and properties change with scale. For example, soil particles change in composition and shape from predominantly bulky quartz and felt par to platy mica and clay over the range of particle sizes from sand and gravel down to silt and clay. A central uh, challenge in geotechnical engineering is to understand the changes in properties and behavior in moving from large to small, whereas a central theme in nanotechnology is to take advantage of this transition and attain novel material performance through non-structural of new materials. So I will repeat that whereas the central, central theme in nanotechnology is to take advantage of this transition and attain novel material performance through nanostructuring of new materials. Among the challenges to be met in introducing nanotechnology into geotechnical engineering is to be able to upscale the nano level phenomena and process descriptions to the macro scale behavior materials and structure that are usual end points of the engineer's effort. The fundamental behavior of clays is the nanomechanics with problem, suggesting that concepts and models developed in nanotechnology can provide new insights and enhance understanding the behavior, understanding of the behavior of clay size particles and even more important, a new means to manipulate or modify this behavior. So Soils and rock are the world's most abundant and lowest cost construction materials. In some states, for example, dense, dry, and cohesive, they are strong and durable. In others, for example, loose, wet, and soft, they are weak and unsuitable. Is it possible or 
even conceivable that new knowledge and the development of processes at the nanoscale may someday transform these materials in ways that can make them even more useful and economical. So that is the basic question that is arising over here. Development in nanotechnology can aid in understanding the fundamental behavior of fine-grained soil at the particle level and lead to the development of engineered fine-grained soils. Readily available atomic force microscopes are now being used in mineral studies to explore the local mineral variations in clays, such as surface charge and local hydrophobicity on mineral surfaces. Nanoparticles might also be engineered to act as functional nanosensors and devices that can be extensively mixed in the soil mass or used as smart tracers for in situ chemical analysis, characterization of groundwater flow, and determination of fracture connectivity, among other field applications. Two categories of soils can be investigated, normal soil and the nano soil. Now, nano soil a product of milling of natural soil in which a greater portion of its particles are pulverized into nano sizes, that is 1 to 100 nanometer. Additives are added to soft clays and peat for soil stabilization because construction is impossible on these soils. Two criteria should be satisfied by any candidate material for soil improvement. Namely, it should be inexpensive and non-toxic. Studies demonstrate that even a small addition of nanoparticles shows marked enhancement in soil behavior. Reduction in plasticity index has important implication in geotechnical engineering. This is because Compaction of high plastic soils will generally result in high shrinkage upon drying. Strength of soil cement mixture increases remarkably when nano soil is added. Additionally, the soil with cement and nano soil has lower tendency for volume change and plasticity index in addition to increase the load bearing capacity. In geotechnical engineering, nanotechnology drew the attention of researchers for last two decades only. In a research study conducted by a farm and uh, Nguyen in 2014, decrease in swell index of soil with addition of nanoparticles was observed. According to Mohammadi and uh, Niazian 2013, Incorporation of nano clay significantly increased shear strength, liquid limit, and plastic limit of cohesive soil. In 2012, Taha and Taha studied compaction characteristics of by adding nano alumina and reported decrease in shrinkage and expansion strains with increase in nano contents. Lynn et al. 2008 presented 1.25 times increase in flexural strength of soil by adding only 0.25% of nano silica to it. In a study conducted by Liu et al. 2012, it was seen that with increase in proportion of nano alumina, plasticity index and the maximum dry density decreased, whereas optimum moisture content increased. Despite above efforts, Research regarding application of nanomaterials in the field of geotechnical engineering is still very limited. Moreover, the environmental and economic impacts of nanomaterials when used to stabilize soil are unexplored. 
comprehensive approach should be formulated to investigate the influence of various engineered nanomaterials. So nano silica, nano alumina and carbon nanotubes are being used extensively to enhance the engineering behavior of clays. An environmental impact of, as environmental impact of nanomaterials are still unexplored, that is whether these pose potential threat to atmosphere or not, it is expected that the application of nanomaterial for soil improvement will help in categorizing the potential toxicity in soil and uh, aqueous atmosphere. The initial cost of the engineered nanomaterial is high. This point is very important. The initial cost of the engineered nanomaterials is high as compared to conventionally used modifiers. However, the benefit cost analysis and durability associated with these additives will provide option to carry overall economy of these modifiers. This aspect of nanoparticles is still questionable for the researchers. Uh, now, at the end, uh, you would find some information about the site remediation by using the nanotechnologies. And a few case studies have been incorporated. So for the next few decades, at the very least, many countries will be faced with serious issues regarding the cleanup of contaminated sites across the country. And in this regard, this nanotechnology will be very, very beneficial. A number of contaminated areas await remedial action and many still await identification. In the past 10 years, emerging technologies such as uh, phytoremediation, bioremediation, and permeable reactive barriers have become popular new tools. These novel treatments have become popular. These novel treatments have begun to compete with more established technologies such as solidification or stabilization, soil vapor extraction, thermal desorption for soil, and pump and treat systems for groundwater. Well, disruption here, the word you can see, uh, disruption. Desorption. Desorption means the process in which molecules leave the surface of solid and escape into the surrounding. So that is called as desorption. At the very forefront of these emerging technologies lies the development of nanotechnology for site remediation. One emerging technology, non nanotechnology, nanocyte zero valent iron and its derivatives, has reached the commercial market for field scale remediation studies. Background Over the years, the field of remediation has grown and evolved, continually developing and adopting new technologies in attempts to improve the remediation process. In the early 1990s, the reducing capabilities of metallic substances such as zero-valent iron began to be examined for their ability to treat a wide range of contaminants in hazardous waste or water. The most common deployment of zero-valent iron has been in the form of permeable reactive barriers, PRBs, designed to intercept plumes in the subsurface and subsequently remediate them. Now, plume is probably a new word for you. Plume means an area over which a dispersed substance is present or it has been spread. The first full-scale commercial PRB permeable reactive barriers 
was approved for use in the state of California by San Francisco Regional Water Quality Control Board in 1994. Technology Overview Nanoscale Zero Valent Iron and Reactive Nanoscale Iron Product comprise the most basic form of nano iron technology. Particles of nanoscale zero valent iron range from 10 to 100 nanometers in diameter or, or slightly larger. Figure 1 shows transmission electron microscope TEM images of uh, this nanoscale zero valent iron. The most common route to nanoscale zero valent iron synthesize is employs sodium borohydrate as the key reductant. By mixing sodium borohydride with FeCl3 6H2O Fe3 plus is reduced. So this figure is showing the uh, transmission electron microscope TEM images of iron nanoparticles. So following the reaction, the reduced particles of iron created could be directly used for contaminated, uh, for contaminant destruction. The stoichiometry uh, of the reduction of trichloroethane to ethane, a typical decontamination reaction would proceed. Now this word is probably new for you, that is stoichiometry. Stoichiometry is the study and the calculation of quantitative relationships of the reactants. A recent study by Liu et al. compared the efficiency and degradation capabilities of NZVI synthesized using sodium borohydride reduction and the RNIP particles produced from ferrous sulfate. It was concluded though that the presence of boron and the shell thickness were the most likely explanations for the observed differences in reactivity. The NZVI particles demonstrated rapid dechlorination of TCE and no deactivation. However, rapid H2 evolution was observed. Other methods of producing nano-sized iron particles also have been developed. Ball milling represents another technique. In this process, micro-sized iron powder is reduced to the nanoscale through an attrition or abrasion process using a ball mill. A vacuum or gas condensation process also has been used to produce nano-sized iron and other materials. As with the addition of metal catalyst to NZVI particles, the formation of emulsified zero-valent iron EZVI also represents an enhancement to the existing NZVI technology. Remedial application. The small particle size and high surface area to mass ratio make iron nanoparticles highly reactive and extremely versatile. So this point is very important. The high surface area and surface reactivity compared with the granular forms enable the nanoparticles to remediate more material at a higher rate and with the lower generation of hazardous byproducts. The ability of the nanoparticles to act as strong reducers also enables the remediation of an extremely wide range of contaminants. Table 1 lists many of the pollutants potentially remediated by nano iron. So you would 
find their thing on table one so this is the table one showing the contaminants remediated by nanoscale iron so look at that In conjunction with nano iron's diverse group of target contaminants, the field scale deployment of particles can be achieved in a variety of ways. Nanoparticles can be mixed with water to form a slurry that can be injected into uh, by using pressure or gravity into contaminated plume. Once injected, the particles remain in suspension, forming a treatment zone. Particles of iron also can be used in an ex situ slurry reactions to treat soil, sediment, and solid waste. The injection of nano iron into the ground represents the most common deployment of this technology thus far. Overall process, overall the process provides a number of remedial benefits. Most importantly, this technique facilitates source zone remediation a clear benefit for site cleanup so you can see here injection well is there and through that that uh, nanomaterial is being injected so site remediation through inject process Now you would find a few case studies of nanoparticles for site remediation and you would find that uh, there was a remarkable improvement in the properties of the soils uh, with the help of this technology. So you will have to go through this case study yourself. Okay, now look at the limitations. Site-specific conditions such as site location and layout, geologic conditions, concentration of contaminants, and types of contaminants may limit the effectiveness of nanoparticles. The research conducted for two sites that have used nanoparticles in fractured bedrock, although several pilot studies have been undertaken. So these are the limitations that we have got from the case studies. Prior to injection of nanoparticles, geologic, hydrogeologic, and subsurface conditions should be evaluated to determine whether injected particles would have adequate subsurface infiltration. Factors that affect subsurface mobility include composition of the soil matrix, iron strength of the groundwater, hydraulic properties of the aquifer, depth to water table, and uh, geotechnical properties. Studies have shown that nanoparticles may not achieve widespread distribution in the subsurface due to agglomeration prior to complete dispersion within the soil or groundwater matrix, limiting the radius of influence. Here the word agglomeration has been used. It means the, the act of, you can say the act or process of collecting in a mass. Now the conclusions. Though the implementation in field is difficult, depends on site condition, but nanotechnology promises as fast site remediation process. So we could be able to remediate a site in a relatively shorter span of time. When accompanied by sound environment safeguarding, the technology may prove to be safe and reliable. Nanotechnological approach would be able to produce substances that conventional biotechnology could not. 
This technique facilitates source zone remediation, a clear benefit for site cleanup. So in this way, in this lecture, we have discussed the use of micro piles and uh, we have discussed the nanotechnologies in ground improvement. Thank you.